there has been a problem in connecting to or learn blackboard that's why i try to uh, do it so that was a temporary problem so we started at 10 past 10 and we'll continue uh, until 11. okay we were talking about uh, the rules of uh, derivatives and that's there was constant multiple rules that we talked about the sum of two functions the derivative is the sum of their derivatives that's another one here uh, if you have a difference of two function the derivative is the difference of the derivatives now let's uh, look at this uh, figure now in order to just demonstrate the positive integer power rule now if i ask you uh, at what point this function have a zero derivative then what you can do is you can take the derivative of each term so that's 4x cubed minus 4x is the derivative of this function you can take 4x out where x is zero this must have a, a zero derivative uh, when you take 4x out you have x squared minus one so at plus or minus one you again have a derivative which is zero and that picture shows that that's the answer to the question that at which points this function has derivative let's continue from this point now the product rule if you have uh, the product of two function its derivative is u times dv dx u times the derivative of v plus v times the derivative of u now let's try to prove this okay so we are going to take the derivative of u times v so if you call u times v f of x plus h and f of x divided by h and now we have u of x plus h v of x plus h since f is the multiplication of these functions minus u of x and v of x now i add and subtract minus u of x plus h times v of x here i subtract and here i add this term now i can uh, rearrange this term u of x is equal to v of x plus h from here and v of x from here okay and plus v of x as u of x plus h and u of x from here uh, u of x plus h from here so that's uh, what you have from here sorry and you have these two terms now when you uh, take the limit as h goes to zero here you have u of x when h goes to zero here you have v of x minus v of x divided by h so which is the derivative of v of x so that's what you get u times dv dx now if you look at this part as x goes to, uh, as h goes to zero you have u of x plus h minus u of x divided by h so that's the derivative of u with respect to x multiply with v of x and then you get this expression so you should always bear this in mind if you have the derivative of two functions you take the derivative of one multiply with the other then you take the derivative of the other multiply with the previous number the previous function so uh, you can this can be separated like this as you can see and at the end we have u times dv dx and v times du dx so that's the multiplication rule let's look at an example suppose u of x is 1 over x and v of x is x squared plus 1 over x 
Now what you can do is, let's take the derivative of this one. That's x squared plus 1 over x and multiply with this one. So 1 over x, that's 2x, the derivative of this, minus 1 over x squared. That's the negative uh, power, but then we are going to prove uh, this later on. Then you take the derivative of this one and multiply with this one. So x squared plus 1 over x minus 1 over x squared. Now, if you uh, do these multiplications, here you have 2 and minus 1 over x cubed here. And here you have minus 1 when you multiply x squared with minus 1 over x squared. You have minus 1 and minus 1 over x cubed. So you have basically 2 minus 1, which is 1, minus 2 over x cubed. Now, there is another approach. Of course, this here, we use uh, the multiple rule for differentiation. But in certain cases, you can just multiply out here, so you get this, x plus 1 over x squared. And then here, again, if you take the derivative 1 minus 2 over x cubed, because the derivative of x squared, 1 over x squared is 1 over minus 1 over x, minus 2 over x squared. So you can do it either way. Either multiply first and take the derivative, or use the uh, multiplication rule for the derivatives. Let's look at another one. Let u is equal to x squared plus 1, and v is equal to x cubed plus 3. OK, so. Uh, what you can do is just uh, take the derivative of this, multiply with this, so you know, x squared plus 1 times 3x squared. Now, take the derivative of this and multiply with this. That's 2x times x plus 3. So if you multiply this out, 5x to the 4, uh, because there's 3x to the 4 here, and uh, 2x to the 4 here, 3x squared and 6x. So that's the result of, uh, the, that's the derivative of this multiplication. Or you can just multiply out here. So you have x to the uh, 5 from here, uh, and x cubed from here, multiplication of this, x to the 5 x cubed, 3x squared plus 3 here. That's the result of multiplication. Now you take the derivative of this, that's 5x to the 4, 3x squared, and here this 6x. And the derivative of the constant is 0. So you get the same result. And you can multiply first and take the derivative, or use the differentiation rule uh, for uh, the multiplication of the two functions. Now let's look at the quotient rule. If u and v are differentiable at x, and if v of x is not zero, then the quotient u over v is differentiable at x. So the condition here is, v of x is not zero at the point that you uh, take the derivative. Because a real number divided by zero uh, is not a real number. OK, so let's call u over v as f. So f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, we take the limit. Now, if you open this up, u of x plus h divided by v of x plus h, and u of x is divided v of x. So uh, multiply by the both denominators here. So you have u of x times v of x minus u of x plus times, times v of x minus u of x times v x plus h. Now, in the denominator, you have v of x and uh, v of x plus h. So 
So what we basically did was multiply both the numerator and denominator v of x plus h and v of x. So these are uh, in here. Now, I again add and subtract u of x times v of x minus u of x v of x. So I add here and subtract here. Okay. Now I can rearrange the terms here. Uh, as you can see, v of x is common here. It's v of x here, v of x uh, also common with this one. So I have u of x plus h minus u of x times v of x. That takes care of this, these two terms. And now uh, u of x is common here and here. So I have minus u of x times u of v of x plus uh, h and minus v of x. All divided by h and v of x and v of x plus h. Now, as you can see, this first term, v of x times, I can take v of x out because it does not depend on uh, h. So it's like a constant when you take the limit as h goes to zero. So you have the derivative of u of x here. And minus, now, the second term, I can take uh, u of x out here. And that's derivative of v of x. Now, if you look at the denominator, as when h goes to zero, v of x plus h v of x is goes to v of x squared. So I have here this expression, which is equal to this expression. So the derivative for quotient of functions, you first take the derivative of the numerator function, u of x. So, and multiply the denominator function. That's this. Uh, so, that's v times du dx. Then you say minus and take the derivative of the denominator function. That's dv of x. And multiply v u of x. And take the square root of the denominator function. So, that's the rule for uh, quotients differentiation rule. So we can now prove uh, that negative powers also obey the same rule. Uh, okay, that's n times x to the n minus 1. We proved that for n positive, but it's true for uh, negatives also. Now u to the minus n is 1 over u to the n. Now we have and the quotient of two function, that's the constant function one, and that's u or to the n. So when I take the derivative of constant function is zero. So the first term is zero. And now I take the derivative of the denominator function minus times and multiply with minus n. So that means minus n u to the minus n plus one here, which is the same rule for the positive. So, uh, and now if you have x to the power n, uh, its derivative of, is derivative as n times uh, x to the n minus 1. So, if n is negative, you have minus n times minus n minus 1 here, basically, if you open it up. So, negative integer and positive integer uh, doesn't make any difference. Uh, and that's the same, uh, the rule is the same for integers. Actually, it's the same for all real numbers, but we have not proved it yet. So let's uh, look at this function. It's x minus 1, x squared minus 2x divided by x to the 4. And we want to take the negative. So we are going to take the derivative of this function. I can take one of, one of the x's out here from this and cancel with x to the 4. So I have x minus 1, x minus 2 divided by x cubed. That's the same thing. So I'm going to take the derivative. I can multiply out. That's x squared minus 3x plus 2 divided by x cubed. 
So if I divide everything by x cubed, I have x to the minus 1. Minus 3 times x to the minus 2, and 2 times x to the minus 3. So when I take the derivative of this, that's minus 1 over x squared, because uh, minus 1 times x to the minus minus 1, so that's 1 over x squared. And here, when I take the derivative, minus 2 times, but I have minus 3, so that's 6 times x cubed. And the other one is minus 3 times 2, that's minus 6 over x to the 4. So you increase the denominator, degree of the denominator polynomial by uh, 1. And that's the result. Okay, find the slope of the curve. That's another example. Y is equal to x plus 2 over x and x equal to 1. And write the equation for the tangent line to this curve at point 1, 3. That's, uh, that's the question. So the first thing I have to do is find the derivative of this function and evaluate at x equal to 1. So that's 1 minus 2 over x squared is the derivative of the function because that's 2 over x or 2 times x to the minus 1, so minus 1 times 2 times x to the minus 2, so that's what we get. Now, if I evaluate at 1, uh, when x is equal to 1, this is equal to 2, so that's minus 2. Uh, the slope of the curve at x equal to 1 is minus 1. So uh, y is equal to 3, so using points formula, y is equal to 3 minus x minus 1. Or you can write this as minus x plus 4. Okay. And you can see here that uh, this is an oblique asymptote for uh, the curve y is equal to x. No, the oblique asymptote for this curve is y is equal to x. Why? Because as x goes to infinity, this goes to infinity, of course, but this becomes very, very small. So y x is the oblique asymptote that this function approaches to. Okay. Now, derivatives, of course, uh, gives the rate of change. And if you uh, have a second line, uh, you take the difference of f of x, 0 plus h minus f of x, uh, then and divide by h. And if h is not 0, that's the average rate of change of a function. But when you take the limit as h goes to 0, so you move x plus h, x of 0 plus h towards x of 0, that gives you the instantaneous rate of change of the function with respect to x at x equal to x of 0. Of course, the limit must exist here. So the derivative of the function gives you instantaneous rate of change. Uh, that's the typical example. S is the displacement function of an object moving along this line, okay, f of t. Now, when you take the derivative uh, of f of t, that gives the instantaneous speed. And if you look at t and t plus 1, between t and t plus 1, and t plus delta t, uh, sorry, uh, and you take the difference uh, with s at t and divide it by the time interval, you get the average speed of the object between two points, f of t and f of t plus delta t. That's the average speed. But when delta t goes towards zero, then you have the instantaneous speed at t. So, 
velocity, instantaneous velocity, basically, is the derivative of position with respect to time. If a body's position at time t is f of t, then the body's velocity at time t is the derivative, as you can see. So that's instantaneous velocity. When you say speed, actually it's a scalar. No, let me just go back. When you say speed, it's a scalar quantity. It doesn't show the direction. When you say velocity, it should include the direction. So you will have minus velocity plus velocity if you are moving along the line. If you look at this figure, okay, you can go this way or this way. In this case, your speed, the velocity will be negative, which you know the direction of the object. If you go this way, it's positive. So velocity uh, shows both the magnitude and the direction, but speed is the absolute value of the velocity. Uh, so let's look at this figure. S is equal to f of t. Now if you look at the derivative of this function, if you look at the tangent line here, it's all positive. Okay, so uh, the derivative is positive, speed is positive. S is increasing positive slope, so moving upward. Now, suppose this is S is equal to F of T. Now, if it's less than zero, then you're going on this direction. Here you are going up, up here you are going down. So the, uh, when you take the derivative of the position function along the line, the last shows also the direction because you will say that v is negative here. You will say that v is positive here. So its absolute value gives you the speed. And it's explained here. Speed is the absolute value of velocity. Let's look at this figure. Uh, that's, that shows you V. This axis is V, and this is seconds. So when V is positive with constant slope, it's speeding up. Now here at this point, V stays a constant, it's steady. It doesn't stop, but it goes at the same speed from between one and two. Now, if that's uh, uh, here, it slows down. V starts from here, go uh, down to zero. So it's a region where uh, the object slows down. Now, and then between here, it speeds up again, but negative. That turns back on the line. Uh, so uh, here it uh, comes to the greatest speed, then it speeds down again, goes to zero. Now here V is zero standstill, the object doesn't move here. And now it goes, speeds up again at this point, after this point. Okay, so that uh, figure shows the relation between speed and uh, velocity. Now, acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Now, if uh, body's position at time t is s, uh, which is equal to f of t, uh, and then the first derivative is v, velocity, and the second derivative is acceleration. The third derivative is called the jerk. But uh, the second derivative is acceleration, tells you how much the speed is changing, whether it's changing in positive direction or negative direction. That's what acceleration is. Speed is meter per second, let's say, and acceleration meter per second at one second. And that's the how much the speed changes at one second. 
of acceleration is the derivative of uh, the velocity. Okay, that's a uh, sort of pictorial representation. A ball bearing falling from rest. At this point, uh, a ball doesn't have any uh, velocity. Uh, but when you just leave the ball from here, due to acceleration, velocity will increase. And in five seconds, it, in one second, it will be here. Uh, but in the second second, uh, it will be here. You can see the speed is actual velocity is increasing due to the gravitational acceleration. Now from here, at third point, still increasing. The velocity of the ball is increasing. So the acceleration here, since the motion towards down is minus, and it's minus 9.8 meter per second square. That's the gravitational acceleration uh, that comes from the Earth. Okay, let's look at uh, some typical problem, uh, practical problem. We will, uh, a dynamite blast throws a heavy rock straight up with launch velocity 49 meters per second. So you are building a road, let's say, and there are rocks, you use dynamite to blow up these rocks. So in a dynamite blast, one rock uh, goes upwards with launch velocity 49 meters per second because that's thrown up. The rack is thrown up 49 meters per second. Now the displacement function is given as 49t minus 4.9t squared. That's the displacement function for the rack. As you uh, can see, when you take the derivative, okay, at t is equal to zero, that's 49, that's the velocity is 49. But later on, due to gravitational acceleration, which pulls the rack downwards, uh, the speed uh, slows down because the acceleration is negative, which tells you the change in speed is negative. Now, the first question is, how high does the rack reach? What's the maximum height? Well, you have the maximum height. Uh, the rock is thrown up with initial velocity for nine meters per second, but the gravitational pull tries to take the rock down. So the speed will decrease, decrease, and become zero. When the speed is zero, the rock starts to fall down. So that's the highest uh, point where you can get. So you take the derivative of S function, the SDT, which gives you the velocity. So that's equal to 49 minus 9.8 T. And when this is zero, you look at and you solve T, 49 over 9.8, which is equal to five. So at the fifth second after the rack is thrown up, it reaches to its maximum height. What is the maximum height then? So you plug t is equal to 5 to this equation, then you find the maximum height, that's 122.5 meters. So the rack goes up 122.5 meters uh, after the dynamite blast. And then it starts to fall down. And the second question is, what are the velocity and the speed of the rock when it is 102.9 meters above the ground, on the way up and down? Now, on the way up, uh, you have uh, 102.9 should be equal to 49t minus 4.9t squared. So, uh, that must be the equation, and 
uh, you solve for t from here and uh, you look at uh, the speed. Okay, that, that's equal to t square minus 10 plus 21. If you divide uh, by 4.9. Okay, so the, the solution for is zero. So that should be zero because this should be equal to one or 2.9 meters. So T is three and seven, there are two solutions. And physically it makes sense because you have on the way up, speed on the way up and speed on the way down. Now the three seconds is so the, the rack is going up now because it reaches maximum at five. So I put three here in this speed equation, okay? Uh, so 49 minus 9.83, that's the derivative. That's 19.6 meters per second is on the way up. So now how about on the way down? Well, it must be seven because after five minutes, the starts to, to fall down. So 49 minus 9.8, times seven, again equal to 19.6 negative. So that makes sense because uh, the rock is falling down. But if you notice here, uh, these are absolute values of, these are uh, same. And so in physics, there is a way of explaining this. When the have a rock was thrown up straight at certain velocity, it has a kinetic energy, okay? Now, because of the Earth's gravitational pull, speed uh, uh, reduces uh, time and time. Uh, so at t is equal to five, the speed is zero. But now here, the kinetic energy of the rock turns into potential energy if we neglect air resistance in this case it could be easily neglected because air resistance doesn't cause much change uh, for a heavy rack so uh, so uh, the potential energy it has is the same as the kinetic energy when it was uh, torn uh, thrown upwards and then this energy doesn't change so at the same point uh, the speed must be same, the kinetic energy must be same. So that's the physical way of explaining uh, this result. Okay. Of course, there's an alternative way uh, where on the way down. This is S, so that must be 1 or 2.5. And you can solve for t from this. Uh, that's two. And you get uh, minus uh, 19.6. That's an alternative uh, way. Here you just put that's one over two, etc. Okay. What's the acceleration of the rack after the blast? Of course, acceleration is constant because the only force which is acting on the rack is the gravitational acceleration of the rack. And at t is equal to five, uh, when does the rack hit ground and, what, and what, at what speed? Now that's uh, this must be uh, here uh, zero, so you get five and ten. Okay, uh, so the speed is nine point eight. It's forty nine uh, meters per second. On the way up, it was plus four the way thirty nine. On the way down, it's minus uh, 49. 
And so the rock hits the ground with the same speed it was thrown out because there is no loss of energy here. So that's uh, physically uh, understandable. So what you basically did here, you put S is zero and solve for T, okay? So that's uh, what you have, T is equal to 10, and V is equal to minus 49. That's what we did. But as I said, there is a physical explanation for this also. Now, if you throw an object straight up with initial velocity V sub zero, then the movement of the object with respect to time is a problem. Because it, uh, the object is thrown out uh, with some speed, uh, just uh, upwards, and stops at certain point and come downwards. Now, so f of t is equal to this, which is a parabola. Now, if you write this parabola as trying to find the symmetry axis, etc., so that's what we can do. That's uh, how. But this is equal to, this is a parabola, which open downwards. Uh, so this is the axis of symmetry. And that's the vertex when t is equal to 49 uh, divided by 9.8. That's the vertex which gives you the uh, maximum height uh, reached. So that's the axis of symmetry, that's the vertex. And the speeds are uh, symmetric around the velocity. That's what you can see also. Because when you take the derivative of this expression, derivative is zero, it's two times minus 49, 9.8, t minus 49 over 98. So, T greater than this and T less than this. These are symmetric about, uh, velocities are symmetric as we have uh, found about this line. And because when it, on the way up at 102.9 meters, the velocity was 19.6. On the way da, uh, down, at the same height, the velocity was minus 19. Okay, so let's continue. That's uh, that's the rock that has thrown up. Now this uh, is S is shown in a different. That's in British units. That's the same problem in British units. It doesn't make any difference. All the other things are the same. So. Uh, that's the parabola that we are talking about. Uh, it's unique parabola is this. That's the where the maximum height is. And as you can see, this is speed and displacement. Okay, as you can see, these are symmetric about this line from phi to the uh, word x, which is the symmetric axis of the parabola. Now, there's an application of the derivative in certain different areas, too. For instance, in economics. Now, you have, uh, if you're producing a, a commodity, you have a cost function. So, uh, X is your number of products that you produced, and the cost is uh, the cost that Next to you. Now there is an interpretation of derivative here. If you increase your production from x to x plus h, and then you have a second line. But uh, if you move this point towards this, that's named as marginal force. So the derivative here, the, the derivative of the cost function is called marginal force. Uh, if you have a revenue function, the derivative of the revenue function 
is marginal revenue in economies. And let's give a pre uh, example. Suppose that the cost of producing X radiators is this C of X. That's X cubed minus 6X squared plus 15X. Let's say dollars in Turkish dirhams. it doesn't make any difference. For producing 8 to 30 radiators, so you have a plant which can produce 8 to 30 radiators in this without any addition of machinery, etc. And the revenue obtained is R is equal to x cubed minus 3x squared plus 12x. So when you produce radiators, you can sell it. And that's the revenue you get as a function of x. That's number of radiators. Now, suppose your shop or your plant is producing 10 radiators per day. What's the marginal cost of producing 11 radiators per day? And what's the marginal revenue? That's an important notion for investors because you will have a cost when you introduce your production. But if the revenue you get, you get is better, then you can decide to produce more. So let's look at this in this sense. You see the axis 3x squared minus 12x plus 15. That's the cost function. Now, if I evaluate it at 10 radiators per day, I have $195 or Turkish dollars, whatever you have. So your marginal cost, this is called the marginal cost, introducing, I mean, uh, increasing your production just by one. That's called marginal cost. And uh, that's 195. Now let's look at uh, the revenue function. This is this is, should be uh, actually R, not C. It's a misprint here. So 3x squared minus 6x plus 12. So marginal revenue, if you evaluate at 10 radiators, it's this. 3 times 10 squares minus 6 times 10, 300 minus 60, so that's uh, 240 plus 12, 250, 2 dollars. Now at this point, if the market is uh, good, we can decide to, reduce, to produce more radiators because uh, you have almost $57 uh, difference between the marginal cost and uh, the marginal revenue. So that might, might be the point that uh, you might decide to uh, uh, increase your production. Okay, so uh, time up. Let's stop here. On Wednesday, we will continue from where we left. Have a nice day.